any questions about after thinking about that for a while um, on how to, in particular, look at these rolling contact motion constraints? Is that all clear? Raise your hand if it's crystal clear. It is? Or you got a question? Question. Yes. That's exactly what we did. In D? In E? Yeah, so let me think about that a second. Um, yeah, the. And got the same answer. Yeah. I think that's correct because um, if you, um, I think the velocity of D and N, yeah, but doesn't it, uh, a point fixed in D will have a velocity associated with that, um, with Q2. And if you, but, but your velocity is still S and N, right? And you are, Right? You're not doing S and E. So, and then, and so what you did different was what? You form, formed the velocity of S and N. That's what I'm trying to look up right now. Mm -hmm. The velocity of point S, which is fixed in D, in N. Maybe you just express that in a different reference frame? So S looks something like this. Well, let's just uh, use um, A, E, X, plus B, E, Y, plus C, E, Z, right? And you could also express it as something else, like uh, D, N, X, plus E, N, Y, plus F, N, Z. Right, we could, you can express it in any reference frame, but it's still the velocity of the S, the point fixed in D and N. We, we expressed it in this reference frame and then looked at the measure numbers in E. Well, if you looked at the measure numbers in N, it's still true that the velocity that's in the ground plane, the component that's in the ground plane has to be zero. And so in X and in Y both still define that ground plane as well as EX and EY. So you could use those two measure numbers and set them each to zero or these two measure numbers and set them each to zero. And you will end up with the same motion constraint. Maybe that's what you did? Yes. Oh. That's correct. But you would have to identify what unit vectors lie in that plane. And they could be any two mutually perpendicular unit vectors that lie in that plane. And they could be moving as E, e is. Um, and if you um, set the measure numbers of those two mutually perpendicular unit vectors that lie in that plane equals zero, no matter how, which ones you use, um, you will get the same motion strings. Does that clarify that you, for you, Josh? I think so. Yeah. So the key thing is, is that 
Yes, uh, the velocity vector. Right, this, this thing has some V of S and N. And it's, it, that velocity vector, um, what, the rolling slip, no, rolling, uh, the, no slip constraint, all it's saying is that if we project this velocity vector into the ground plane, that whatever components of that projection have to be zero. And those could be projected in any coordinate system that you set up there, as long as they lie in the plane. Yeah? So it's not sufficient enough to say V of S and N is zero? Um, well, <clears throat> in this case, it's fine because this point doesn't move off the ground either. But we, um, if, you, if we had designed this problem where the point wasn't touching the ground and then enforced that constraint, that's a, um, a configuration constraint, it turns out to be. And um, we implicitly enforce that by how we specified our position vectors. Right? We basically said that you know, this one had to always be aligned with the up direction, and this one too. And um, we didn't have to explicitly solve for that. Our choice of like mod choice of coordinates and modeling the system um, implicitly set that configuration constraint of the wheel always touching the ground. Chris. <coughs> Yeah. You s v of S and N is zero, this whole expression. But the one, this this constraint that's associated with the z direction. Is integrable if you check it, and you'll find, and it's it's really just a configuration constraint. So the only two that we're concerned about are the planar velocity has to be zero for this no slip condition. So the no slip condition is different than the wheel t ha always touches the ground. So it's true in this case that this is this is true. Um, and that this is going to end up being a configuration constraint, c equals 0, if it's integrable. And that um, we implicitly ensured that was the case by the way we set up the problem. Okay. You could set up the problem with another, config another, another coordinate that, that would allow the wheel to be off the ground. Right? Maybe an angle between uh, here and, and this line. So we could, we could say the wheel could come off the ground at that point. And that might be more realistic or something in your, if you're doing a model of a trailer. It could come off the ground. And then we could form this thing, take C, integrate it, get the configuration constraint, set it to 0. And, and we'd also have, uh, and we'd enforce that and create the same model. Is that clear? Questions? Yeah. So that that point is is uh, the fact that it has to be in the ground plane is a um, positional related constraint, right? It can't ever have a z component of that vector. Right? If I have a vector from here, from here to here, can't have a z component. And when we set up the problem, it just didn't it didn't have a z component, right? If you remember when we wrote the vector from I think here to here, it, it didn't have a z component. So we, we assumed that was zero from the get-go. But you could, you could model the problem in a way that that wouldn't in, in implicitly be zero, and then you would have to enforce that if you want the wheel to touch the ground. Okay. Yeah? Other questions on, the, on last week? Or last Monday? I'm, a, I'm a, all over the place. I'm hardly keeping up with creating two new classes. If you all become professors,
you will, uh, um, how many people have taught a full class before? Not many things. All right, well, you're, you'll learn some in your TA, but um, surprisingly, it takes so much time. <laughs> so I uh, don't even know what day of the week it is. All right, so today, there's, I want to spend the first hour on, on one more topic, uh, which will be the last topic of Chapter 2 that we cover. And then the last half, we'll do some review. So um, there's, two, there's two more uh, sections in the chapter that we haven't gotten to. We're only going to go over the partial velocity ones. And uh, the last one is um, the accelerations in partial velocities, which is not as critical to move forward, but you can read that if you want. So today, let's um, introduce a new concept. There's something that we're going to refer to as partial velocities and partial angular velocities. And the reason we're introducing these is that they turn out to be a very critical um, part of developing equations of motion with, with Kane's approach. And um, these partial velocities relate to the generalized speeds that you choose for your problem. And ultimately, they're going to allow us to um, decompose the uh, accelerations and the forces and torques that make up F equals ma in terms of the generalized speeds. So let me just write sort of the definition of this. And we'll talk, maybe not, probably not today, but later about the significance once we get into forming the equations of motion. So say we have n minimal number of generalized coordinates. And then we've also defined n generalized speeds for our problem. We may have uh, lots of rigid bodies. And points that we're keeping track with, with all these different coordinates. So we use them to keep track of some complicated system. And it turns out that all velocities and angular velocities in this system All the velocities and angular velocities in the system can be expressed uniquely as functions of the generalized speeds. And in particular, if I take some given angular velocity, I can decompose it like so. So the sum of some vector omega r times the rth generalized speed plus some other vector. These have some names. We're going to call this the rth partial angular velocity. 
This is the rth generalized speed. And then there's also potentially a remainder vector. There, a remainder term. So this is a, <clears throat> each of the velocities can be linearly expressed with respect to the generalized speeds. Okay? And we can take any velocity vector and decompose it once we have some generalized speeds. And as a corollary, any velocity of a point or particle also can be de decomposed, like so. And this is, once again, the rth partial velocity. It's important to note that omega r, vr, two partial velocities, and the remainder terms are functions of all the q's and potentially time. And, and implicitly all the constants in the problem, too, right? So the, there's no use in these definite, in, in these partial vectors in that case. And another important note is that omega r, the rth partial velocity, equals the partial derivative of omega with respect to the partial, uh, with respect to the rth um, generalized speed. And then the same thing goes with the So if I take the partial derivative of some vector expression with respect to that particular generalized speed, I would get this term, right? Because it's just linear in the in the speeds. Where? Yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. Vt. Right? Anybody not have that screen there? OK. Let's look at a little example. See how we might get a hold of these. I'm going to have a horizontal line here that has a cut my eraser. Horizontal line. There's a point here that we're going to track with a generalized coordinate Q1 to move along that line. And that point is a pin joint for a compound pendulum that hangs here. We'll call this point A, point B, and point A. The angle, we'll call Q2. We'll call this the rod R. And We'll set up a inertial reference frame here in one and two, like so. And this rod has a length L. Right? So it has two generalized coordinates, right? It can slide back and forth, and, um, and it's a simple compound pendulum, so it can swing. So we have uh, 
two generalized coordinates at the moment. Q1, Q2. And is this, how many, how many um, configuration constraints does this have? as defined. Hmm? How many people think it's one? Nobody? What do other people think? This goes back to the thing I was just saying about implicit and explicit definitions of configuration constraints. Two? How many people think it's two? Three people? Any other guesses? As defined, it's zero. There's no configuration constraints. <clears throat> okay. Um, it, uh, these two coordinates uniquely define its configuration at any point in time. Right? Um, Neither one of them, you know, for, it to, for there to be a configuration constraint, Q1 would have to be a function of Q2 or vice versa. Okay? But I can set those independently, and they don't affect each other. All right? That's one way to think about it. Um, we could, if I freed the point A from the line and then drew two extra coordinates to the point, Q3 and 4, and then I said Q3 has to be 0 and Q4, um, I'm sorry, if I freed it from the line with one more coordinate, Q3, like a heart, like a vertical displacement, and then I said that Q3 has to be 0, that could, we could call that a configuration constraint. Um, and it would eliminate, you know, one, config, one, one of the variables. But they're both independent. So how many degrees of freedom do we have? Little n is 2, and then number of degrees of freedom, people are saying that it's 2. Why is it 2? Why is it, why is it 2? How do, you, how do you know how many degrees of freedom a system has? <clears throat> but don't we know that degrees of freedom can be smaller than the number of configuration constraints in certain cases. Is that true? Why not? The, the problem we did last time had uh, how many coordinate, how many generalized coordinates? It had the angle of the trailer, Q2. It had Q1 along it, that's 2. And then it had the rotation of wheel 3. So it had three GCs in, and that uniquely set the configuration. In was three. How many degrees of freedom did that system have? One. We only had one because we had two motion constraints. N is the minimal number of generalized coordinates minus the number of motion constraints gives you the degrees of freedom. So in this case, if you claim this is 2, M must be 0. Is that true? Yeah, we don't have any motion constraints. There's no um, additional con constraints that we can draw up with, with respect to the velocities that would prescribe some kind of constraint in motion. All right. So we're there. Um, there are no motion constraints. And no config constraints as defined in this case. So let's write a couple of the velocities. The velocity in, of A and N equals Q1 dot N1 hat. And I'm going to make the assumption that 
a new general speed u1 equals q1 dot. I define this. So then I can write this as such. Okay, so that point can move in n. And then we want to get the velocity of b in n. And we can use our um, two-point theorem here, right? A and b are both fixed in body R. So I can write the velocity of A and N plus omega of B and A crossed with R, which is the um, vector from B with respect to A. So then we have U1 in hat plus omega B and A is um, Q2 dot. And it's in the z direction, so you can write that as n3, n3 direction, crossed with this vector that is um, L in the, if I set up some new coordinates here, L1, L2. It's in the negative L, L2 direction. Right? We can then expand that um, all in the end frame, and we'll get short notation Q. <coughs> Two in one hat minus L S two in two hat. And write that all out and we get Q one dot plus L Q sorry. U one plus L Q two dot S two all in the N one minus L U2 dot C2 and N2. Okay, velocity of B and A and N. And we've replaced, we've created one definition of a generalized speed and we've replaced that. And we still have a Q2 dot left in this expression here. Um, We'll go ahead and take the simple case here, too. Say that u2 equals q2 dot. And then that expression is 1 L u2 s2 in 1 hat minus L u2 c2 in 2. So now I have the velocity of b and the velocity of a in n expressed in terms of the generalized speeds. Right? There's no q, q dots in these expressions. So that is um, key. We can also write this angular velocity in terms of that u2. And now we have three two linear velocities and one angular velocity expressed in terms of only the generalized speeds and the coordinates. There are no time derivatives of the coordinates in the expressions. Okay, so that's critical. We want to eliminate all qi dot. from the velocity. So now that we have these expressions, let me circle them. This one, this one, and that one. Expressed that way, we can now find the partial velocities. So it turns out that um, 
instead of taking that partial derivative, as I wrote before, we can also just look at these, inspect them, and find out what terms would be the partial of the velocity with respect to u1 or u2. So if we start with the notation I'll use here is the velocity of a in n say the first partial velocity is the one that corresponds to u1. So we look at a and n. What's the first partial velocity that corresponds to u1? And recall the definition of the partial velocities is vr equals the sum of, sorry, V equals the sum of VR, the rth partial velocity, times UR plus VT. So if this is a general expression for any velocity in the system. We have a velocity in the system. What would the partial velocity what would VR and VT be in this case? One? Which, what is one? V, what is, are we talking about VR or VT? VR. So if you say that V1, if that is one, then I can write out, I can write this out more formally. I can say that V up above equals 1 times U1, right, this, this portion. Does that look right? Do we get do we get V back? That's the V we were hoping to get. Is this a vector? It's not a vector, for one thing. Right, th this should be a vector. Partial velocity is a vector, not a scalar. Here we have a scalar times a scalar. So what do you think? So th this is not correct. One's not correct. Say it again. Huh? Yes. So what is VR? In one. Yes. So now, if I write that, I got the first partial derived velocity is in one times the first generalized speed gives me V, and that's V. Okay? So it's whatever is multiplied by U1 up in the top expression. Okay? And there may be a remainder, um, VT. In this case, VT was zero. So that's V1. So what about V2 of A and N? What's the second partial velocity of A and N? I think I heard it who said that. Zero. There's no U2s in that velocity. So by inspection, that is zero. Right? So then if we, now we could form this whole, whole equation. It would be this plus zero times U2 plus zero. So that is that, and that makes up these two terms, right? And if we add all that together, we end up with the velocity. So this is the first partial velocity, second partial velocity, the remainder. Yeah? OK, so now uh, take a couple of minutes and find out V1V and N and V2B and N by inspection.
So now you have a little more complicated compression there. What, what are the partial velocities? Take a couple of minutes and uh, see, see if you can get that. Feel free to chat with your neighbor about it. fast you can do this. How many people got these partial velocities? Everybody, all right? What's the what's this first partial velocity of V, B, and N? In one hat? Is that what I heard? There's only one U1 in that expression, and it's a coefficient only two in one hat. What's VB, the second partial velocity in B? Anybody brave? In one hat, LS2 minus That's correct. The coefficients, if I factored out u2, um, I would get the, this is the coefficient to u2. And then finally for um, omega here, what is the first partial velocity? Zero. There's no 
u once, and then the uh, second partial velocity, n3. All right. That's all it is to it. It's not too complicated. Um, the other way to get it is uh, if you have a super long expression, which you are going to have with some of your problems, if you take the partial derivative of VB and N with respect to U1, you'll also get all the coefficients of U1, as long as it's linear in the U's like we, uh, we have defined. Yeah? So you can do them by inspection. You know, factor things so that you get all the u1s, all the u's as coefficient as uh, um, independent terms, and then look what the coefficient is, or take the partial of these vectors with respect to that u, and um, you also get that coefficient. All right? That's all there is to those partial velocities. Um, let's look at one more aspect um, here. And I want to bring back one of the examples that we looked at before. This one. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm showing you this without explaining why we care about the partial velocities. And um, I'll, I'll say a couple words to that after we do this example. Um, but when we get into forming F equals MA, um, you're going to see the real power of why we calculate the partial velocities. All right, so I'm just making you do it without telling you why at the moment, which is, you know, you can read ahead if you want, but... Uh, um, it's just sort of a, it's, it's, a, it's not that hard to do them, um, and we're going to have to do them. And, we'll, and, we'll, and they'll become very important a little bit later on, okay? Uh, but, but they basically um, allow you to look at a velocity vector and <clears throat> think about if I change generalized speeds, what's the sensitivity of that velocity vector to those generalized speeds? And a given velocity vector may or may not be that sensitive to all generalized speeds. Okay? So really, what they allow you to do is they sort of give you these vector quantities that give you the sensitivity of a, any given velocity vector to each generalized speed. And that's going to become, become very useful to us as we move forward. Yeah, so if, if you think about, I'll just go ahead. I was going to do this at the end, but let's go ahead and do it. Some velocity vector v, right? And let me make sure I draw it like I want it. <clears throat> if we find out the partial velocities, and the partial velocities end up looking something like this, Right? They're all vectors, and they are the coefficients to the u's, and if I sum u times those velocity vectors, I get the vector back, right? So, <clears throat> if I multiply v1 times u1, I'll get, let me do those in a different color. I'll get this new vector. V1, U1. Right? And then same thing with this might be V2, U2. And then for this all to work out, this would have to be it's not quite the same direction. 
the, these red ones should all have the same directions as the corresponding piece. But so I get the sum of those vectors. These are the sort of components of V, right, that are associated with those speeds. And in this case, we can see that uh, if I change u1, u2, or u3, I'll get different changes in v. And uh, the one that's bigger, right, is, makes it, it's more, this, is, this one's more sensitive, right? So v is more sensitive to u1 than u2 and u3. And it has sensitivity in magnitude and direction. Right? So it's a way to look at how any given velocity vector, and we'll find out later too, any given force or torque, how, uh, what its sensitivity is with respect to the use. Okay, so partial velocities, um, represent the sensitivity of V or omega to the, let's write, to the chosen generalized speeds. And it's also a uh, projection of V into that U space there. Yeah. Projection of V onto V1 is U1, et cetera. That makes sense? All right, let's look at this example. Where are we at? We're at 10, 10.53. Let's take a break, come back at um, uh, 10.57, and then we'll do this example, and then we'll move into the review. Um, you can tell if you uh, want to tell me any things you want to talk about on the review or or whatever. You know, go to the feedback form during the break, and you can anonymously put some things up there. We had one request from Holly on uh, Piazza to to look at a particular one of the particular examples, and I'll do that. Um, but you can either Put, put some stuff in here to give me some feedback to read during the break or um, just say it publicly when we get there. All right, so come back in five minutes. I'm going to get a sip of water. <laughs>
not a Q1 dot. Omega Q1 in the EZ, right? That's the same. So we can, exp we can express it in another reference frame. And then also we could even express it in the A reference frame, which is the inertial one in this case. And that is Q1 dot uh, cos omega t uh, minus omega Q1 sine omega t. in the AX direction plus uh, Q2 dot in the AY minus Q1 dot sine omega T plus omega Q1 cos omega T in the AZ. All right, so I have the same velocity vector for this point expressed in three different reference frames. Right, exclusively in B, E, or A. And if you do work out all that, you can you can get those expressions. Right? And we, we, we did that essentially before. Uh, we didn't express it all the way in the A frame, I don't believe, but I think we had the other two. So we could use any one of these velocities to define our um, generalized speeds. Okay, so So I could say u1 equals q1 dot, u2 equals q2 dot, u3 equals negative omega q1, for example. Or I could say u1 equals this, u2 equals that, u3 equals that, or so on. Okay? <clears throat> and this is the, you know, as the modeler of the system, you get to choose what, how you define the generalized speeds. So let's look at... I think I'm going to go to a new page. <clears throat> Does anybody not have that page? Um, it'd be nice to have those visible, though. Let's um, actually, let me just sort of make a little more space here, if I can. I'm going to slide this up there. Make a, oops, make a partition around that. All right, so we got a little space here. Um, for, we'll call this case one, case two, and case three. And that, oh my geez, why did they disappear? This program is funny like that sometimes. So for case one, we'll start up here, we can write the partial velocities. V, P, 1, and A, partial velocity 1. V, 2, P, 1, and A. And V, 3, P, 1, and A. Three generalized speeds. And if I say that... Um, for the first case, for example, right, u1 equals q1 dot, u2 equals q2 dot, and u3 equals negative omega q1. We define those partial velocities, I mean, sorry, those generalized speeds as the measure numbers of case one. And then we can figure out by inspection what the partial velocity of p1 uh, in A with respect to the first, and that would be Bx, right? So it's U1 Bx, 
And then P1 in A with respect to partial velocity 2 is simply By. And partial velocity of 3 um, is what? Third partial velocity. BZ. So what um, what does the three stand for up there? It's uh, yes. I'm confusing myself. <laughs> trying trying to trick you, but I'm just tricking myself. Okay, so BZ. Now for the second case, um, is that all all I wanted to do there? Yes. For case two, you can also find partial velocities. Will these be the same? And why? Say it again. Measure numbers are different. <clears throat> so we're going to define we're going to define then u one as this expression. And actually, is that maybe am I doing what I want to do here? Yes. So, what would the partial velocities be here if we define the u's as the measure numbers of case two? And I forgot one one thing. Let, let's step back. Uh, I think I think I, I did I didn't do this exactly the way I wanted to. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Let's just erase let's erase this. This is why I was getting confused. All right. So let's, I'm going to just define these cases explicitly. U1 equals Q1 dot. U2 equals Q2 dot. And U3 equals Q3 dot. OK, this is the simplest definition of the generalized P's that you can make. It's always valid, and um, we can do that. So now, if I if I start with case one, All right, now what's the first partial velocity of P1 for case 1? Bx, that's the same. First partial velocity of P1 with respect to U2, By. And then first partial velocity of P1 with respect to uh, the third, that's supposed to be a 3, the third generalized speed. Now it's zero. So that's why I was trying to, trying to, trying to wonder why, why I wasn't getting zero there. Yes? Correct. So this has no um, Q dots in it. And I, I can't say uh, any function, if, if I define a generalized speed, it has to be a function of the Q dots. You know, it has to be a kinematical differential equation. And in that case, that was an invalid um, specification of U. So what are we missing? Are we missing anything for this definition of the partial velocities? The VT term. <clears throat> 
And what is that? Yeah. Okay, so this is the full specification of the velocity. We have the partial velocities with respect to 1, 2, and 3, u1, 2, and 3, and then that there's a remainder term in this case. That's where I wanted to go with that. Okay, for case 2, let's define some different ones. So I'm going to say that u1 equals q1 dot c3 plus q2 dot s3. And u2 equals q2 dot c3 minus q1 s3. And u3 is going to be q3 dot again. Now, for case 2, what are the partial velocities? And notice that u1 here is the measure number, what did I pick? q1, c3, q2 dot, that's a 3. That's the measure number of this expressed in, Q, in e. And this is the measure number here, q2, c3 minus q q1s3. Right. So that's the measure numbers of the try to increase that a bit. Okay. So in this case, what would the first partial velocity be if the u's are defined as such? EX and the second EY, the third can here zero. zero again, right? We don't have um, Q three in that uh, Q U uh, three in that expression, and then the remainder. Right, so that's case two. And we get different partial velocities for different sets of generalized speeds that we define. So whatever ones you choose, and uh, like we've talked about before, it is useful to choose more complicated definitions of your generalized speeds often because you'll ultimately end up with simpler acceleration expressions when you take that, that derivative. All right, so we can choose either one, and we get those partial velocities. Um, where would we find a partial velocity that's related to u3 in this case? And uh, q3, remember, is that. Velocity P2, it would show up in there. What else would it show up in? Omega. Yep, omega of E and A. So um, those, the angular velocity of um, B, I'm sorry, E, and then also the uh, um, velocity of, linear velocity of point 0.2 would potentially have a partial velocity related to U3. I'll leave that up for you to verify. All right, that's what I want to say about the partial velocities. Any questions on that? You're going to have to do some in your exam. And um, it's, it's relatively straightforward, but you have to keep track of things. And, uh, and they will be different depending on your definition of your use.
Um, it doesn't have to be. It um, may make your life a little easier. Like here, we were able to pick off EY. But <clears throat> if I still use this definition, um, I could ultimately express this in terms of B and, and then take the partials with respect to the new U's, and I would get whatever EY is expressed in B here. It'd still be the same partial, but I can express EY in, in terms of B too. So you don't have to. They can be expressed in any combination of frames that you want. Um, this case, I, I, put, I put them in, you know, expressed in one frame for the sake of the example. But if you take the partial derivative of that vector with respect to the u, no matter how it's expressed, you will get the right, you will get the right answer. Chris? I don't know if I'm following completely. So, say this again. So, like, we express the velocity of u1 and a in the b frame and in the e frame, right? And then we chose two different generalized speeds. Would you have to keep track of what you chose in each instance? So that way, if you had to say back out, uh, like, like the velocity vector. Yes, you, you will need to keep track of this. So as the modeler, you get to make this decision, however you want to define the use, and you want to keep those around, right? These now become, these are the kinematical differential equations that relate the use to the Q dots. And you have to integrate these equations when we want to um, solve for the trajectories of the Qs. Right? So these um, are a critical ordinary differential equation that you will need uh, when you want to solve F equals MA, basically. So you need to keep track of this, and, and they're gonna, you're going to carry those along. And uh, when we do numerical integration, we're going to integrate these ordinary differential equations also. That's it. You're locked in for that system. You can't change these after that. You pick one set of, of, of kinematical differential equations that you define, and that's it for that system. Don't change them. If you change them, you'll, you're going to screw it. You'll get all screwed up. Yeah. Any other questions on partial velocities? All right. So <clears throat> we got uh, 40 minutes. And I had a request from Holly to look at uh, the uh, example 2.7 in the back of the book, or I mean, problem, problem 2.7, and look at the code. I posted some, some of the problems solved with SymPy um, that are in the PyDi uh, GitHub repository. And one of them is that problem. And, she, and, and then uh, I also have, I also can just, you know, uh, list all of the main concepts and equations that we've gone over to reiterate as a as a quick review. Um, and then lastly, I can answer questions from you all. Do you, uh, the question I guess for you is: Do you want me to spend any time listing the um, the topics that we've gone over, or is that uh, is that clear? Raise your hand if you would like me to. Like just do a probably, hopefully ten to fifteen minute review of the topics. One, two, three, four, five, five out of that's like a tie, I think. Four, five, five. Somebody break the tie. All right, <clears throat> we'll break the tie, and 
I'll go over those. I'll try to not spend too much time on them, um, but let's uh, do that real quick. Um, so, starting from chapter one, we have um, vectors, right? What is a vector? And that includes definitions of measure numbers, right, and components. We also introduced reference frames. And uh, mutually perpendicular unit vectors fixed in a reference frame, right, that we use. And we learned how to take derivatives. of vectors in different reference frames. And then lastly, um, I think main topics there were, uh, oh yeah, two, two more things. One is um, uh, differentiation of sums and products. And then lastly, uh, total derivatives and we had to use the chain rule to work those out, right? Some of the key, equa key equations there were uh, that um, we had this notation, the uh, partial derivative of any vector v with respect to some q in a reference frame A equals, it was defined as the sum from i equals 1 to 3 of um, v i partial of um, uh, Greek VI, I guess, with respect to Q plus uh, a term that might be partial of VI. I, I think it, th that's it. Oh, geez. Why does it do that? That's why it does that. Huh, it's uh, surprising me how, how crappy this thing is. And that, oh, there it disappears. It thought it was there a second, disappears. What an interesting partial of little vi, where, um, and that's a hat, where v equals right? If I express a vector in these mutually perpendicular re um, um, unit vectors that are fixed in A, in this case, v, the V hats are fixed in A. And actually, for that to be clear, let me use um, V1, A1, plus V2, A2. And then uh, make this A hat I. Right? So if I express that vector completely in terms of in that reference frame, then I can just take the partials of the measure numbers with respect to whatever variable of interest, and I get my derivative. Right? So that's key there. <clears throat>
You have to be very aware of taking the partial derivatives in the re reference frame. And then if I want the total derivative of some vector v in A, for example, with respect to t, that's going to be, we've got to use the chain rule here, and that's going to be um, d v i with respect to t uh, Am I writing this right? Plus the partial of. I'm going to not remember these off the top of my head. these before, but I don't have a way to display two things on the screen at once. So if I take the partial with respect to whatever functions q that are implicit in time, times qr dot plus the partial of v with respect to t, with respect to dt, um, then that's correct. And that apply it. And then the other one, did I, did I write that correctly? Yeah. OK. Those are the two, two main derivatives that, we gotta, that we're dealing with. Like we're going to be taking the partial of with a v with respect to time, where there's, measure, there's uh, variables in the measure numbers that are implicitly a function of time. So you have to um, take, ensure that you have the chain rule there going. And then those are our derivatives. Okay. So next, we moved into kinematics. And... <clears throat> We had a definition of angular velocity. Let me get there. I know I'm going to get this one wrong. Omega of B and A is defined as B1 hat dB2 hat dt dotted with B3 plus B2 hat d b3 dt, both of those are in a, dotted with b1 hat plus b3 d b1 a dt dotted with b2 hat. Definition of angular velocity, and then we um, also talked about simple angular velocity. And that basically looks like some scalar omega, simple rotation about some arbitrary unit vector k. We also um, took derivatives with respect to two reference frames, right? And if you recall, if I want to know the derivative, time derivative, of some vector v in A, and I happen to know the time derivative of v in B, and the angular velocity of B in A, I can cross that with um, that vector v. So this is a very useful theorem here if you know the angular velocity of B and A, and then um, the time derivative of some vector with respect to the frame B, you can also f find it in a related reference frame. We talked about auxiliary reference frames. <clears throat> 
and this allowed us to use the addition theorem to formulate um, angular velocities of somebody. Right? And this is very useful for simple rotations. And if you recall, too, no addition theorem for alpha B and A. We talked about that. Um, and then we looked at angular acceleration. And angular acceleration of B and A is defined as the time derivative in A of omega of B and A. And then for simple angular acceleration, alpha and B and A is simply alpha k hat, where alpha equals d omega dt. All right, so now we can fully specify the kinematics of reference frames that are oriented relative to each other. And uh, one key thing is that um, we really only use reference frames. Um, uh, I don't want to say that. Let's uh, move forward here to linear acceleration. Does anybody not have that page? Go to a new page. So then we have linear velocity and acceleration. And those velocity of some point in reference frame A is defined as the time derivative of the position vector P with respect to T. And then the acceleration vector of that, of that um, point P is the time derivative of the velocity vector in A with respect to the reference frame A. So we had those as simple definitions, but when we expand those for certain, certain cases, for example, two points on a rigid body or reference frame, we get this nice, very useful formula. The velocity of P and A equals the velocity of Q, another point fixed in the rigid body, a, uh, B in this case, plus omega B in A crossed with R of P with respect to Q. So if P and Q are fixed in the same body, and you know the velocity of that one of, of Q, all you need to do is compute this to find the velocity of P in A. Yeah? Yes. yes. P and Q are fixed relative to each other in B. All right? We also had a one point moving on a rigid body. You know, I can make uh, back to the other one a little sketch, right? That you can draw to remind yourself. If I know Q and I know P, and then this is R, and this body has some angular velocity, omega B and A. 
this is A, and R is constant in B. It right, does the sketch for that one. And then the sketch for this next one is given some reference frame A, some reference frame B, or rigid body B. There's a point P moving along some path in B. Right? So in this case, P is moving in B, and the other um, P is fixed with respect to Q and B. This ends up being that V of P in A equals the velocity of B bar in A plus V of P in B. Right? So the velocity of P in B, you might know how this thing's moving in B, so I can get this term. And then this term, this B bar, right, remember B bar is a point fixed in B at that instance of time. Okay? It's similar to our rolling wheel points, right? This is a point that's fixed in B at that particular instant of time. It happens to correspond to where P is. And then you and then this equation is valid, as well as um, the uh, corollary acceleration equation. A of P and A equals A of P and B plus, I'm sorry, getting that wrong, A of P and, uh, acceleration of P and A equals the acceleration of B bar in A plus the acceleration of P in B plus 2 omega B A crossed V B. Right? This is the Coriolis term. And What I forgot to do is uh, also write the corollary for the two points. So we have that. Let's go back to the two point theorem. And we can also write A of P in A equals A of Q in A plus omega B in A crossed with omega B in A crossed with R of P with respect to Q. plus alpha of B in A crossed with R P with respect to Q. And here we have centripetal acceleration term tangential term. Right? So these, all these are critical theorems that will let, help you get a hold of the linear velocities and accelerations of various points on moving frames. Okay, so that was two, the two-point theorem. And then we talked about, uh, we're at 1140, we've got 20 minutes left. I'd, li I'd like to have some time for questions. This is, I, I just talked to not very fast with this. How about <clears throat> I'll add the last couple of things, configuration constraints, motion constraints, to the sheet. I'll post it right after, after class. And um, a few things. Pass these around. Right? These are the uh, instructions for the exam. I'd like you to sign that saying that you're not going to cheat, basically. And uh, pass those back in. And then... Um,
and I'll post some more notes there. And I want to let's see. So if you want to get out your laptops, go to bicycle.ucdavis.edu and then um, let's make sure that you can get a hold of the exam. So if I, if I log in, um, notice there's these other tabs up there. <clears throat> you go to assignments, there's MAE 223 exam 1, and you can fetch that. And that will copy the exam to your directory. So if I fetch that, and then I come back to my files tab, and I refresh it, I should see a folder here now called MEA 223-2017 Exam 1. And if I click go into that folder, there's a, a notebook. And you can open that up. And this is the exam. Um, so the rules that you're signing here is that you can use any reference you want. It should be your independent work, right? No discussion or collaboration whatsoever in any form with any other person. And that means on Q&A websites or chat rooms or anybody in the class or anybody that took the class or anything. You don't talk to anybody about it. Do not share the exam, um, academic and dishonesty to Jewish affairs. And then the technical things, you can use the code cells to do computations and use markdown cells to write prose style answers. You may add cells as needed. Do not include any scratch work, okay? Whatever you turn in should be the clean, simple answer that you want to present. I don't, I don't want to look through other stuff. Okay? I will give you partial credit on the answer you present. Um, and then, once you're done with it, you're going to save this thing as you go along. And if you go back to the exams, notice that this now has an option to submit. You can submit multiple times before the due date, if you want. And, um, but it has to be submitted by 10 a.m. Monday morning, the, your final submission. A few other details on the notebook. Um, there's three problems. Right? There's some description, a figure. And then <clears throat> you're supposed to type your answer here. Two, two things. One is, it says, explain to me something in words. So if I double click that, I can type my answer to this thing, right? And there's your answer. And then here, um, if you use, I'm asking you to use SimPy to do something, delete this and ignore that. Um, I don't know why this second line popped in here. I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I'm supposed to just say your code here. You erase this and you type your code here for your answer. Okay? And it has to execute. Make sure that your whole notebook executes. And to do that, at the end of your exam, restart and run all is the way to do that. Okay? It should all, if I run restart and run all, I should not see an error. That's the goal. Um, so there's different questions like that. And then problem two is a true and false. And what you're supposed to do here is put true, Python true, capital T, lowercase everything else, and then an explanation. This is why it is true, right? <clears throat> so you, write, you do true or false, and then you explain it for those problems. <clears throat> 
And then the, uh, the, the first and the third problem are similar. There's some figure, an explanation, and then you have to tell me about it. And they all have point values. So where are we at? We got uh, 15 minutes. Um, questions here, if you want to have any specific exam. If you, um, I'm going to try to, I don't know if I'm going to, I'm going to try to address Holly's question, or maybe I'll just type up an answer for that. We don't have time, but Chris. Yes. Documentation is up. I put that up uh, on the website. So if you go to software, it tells you how to do it right there. But all it is is. Um, if I come back to my files and I create a new terminal and type backup dash home, it zips up my home directory and then you download it. Right? Yeah, key thing there, <clears throat> right? We're working with technology here that something may go wrong. Back it up as you work, download it. Um, even if my server fa fails uh, and you lose your work, that's not my, I'm not, that's not my fault. I'm going to blame it on you because you didn't back it up. All right? If the server does fail or something, we will, uh, I'll give you extended time. But, <clears throat> uh, but if you lose work, that's your problem. So don't lose it. Back it up as you, as you go along. And that means take it off the server to your computer, that file. So you turn in the one file, it must all, all execute, don't include, include scratch work, da da da. Questions? More questions here? Chris? Yeah. Um, I forget that offhand. It's, uh, it only matters if you want to use that to manually um, construct vectors. And, um, and, I, and, I, and because that's the case and I, and I rarely manually construct them from the DCM, I forget what it is. Um, I, I would suggest that you do one by hand and see what it is. Right? You can quickly work out a one and, and see uh, which, if if it's the transpose or the non or the or or what, or what it is. Yeah. Other questions? If you have questions during the exam, you you can ask them on Piazza as long as they're not, um, you know, if it's a if it's a clarifi clarification of a problem or something. Those kind of questions. Um, uh, no, I'm not going to answer questions about syntax. Right? You're supposed to have practiced that, and um, and you know where the resources are to look things up by now. So I, I won't answer those kind of questions. On, only clarifications. So you gotta you're gonna have to hack at it by yourself, and um, and I'll, I'll I'll answer things very minimally on Piazza. And if somebody asks on Piazza a question, um, uh, I would like no no student should answer it. I will I will answer it. Okay. Um. So we got ten minutes. Um, <clears throat> one of the the problem that Holly was interested in was that two seven, which is the rolling disk. I don't think I can. Ex like parse through that code in 10 minutes and figure out what it is. So I, I think I'm just going to promise to post something about that. I'll, I'll try to add some comments to that solution. And I think there were some other questions on Piazza that popped up about 2.7. That is a rolling, rolling disk on a plane problem, right? Yeah. I'll post a solution to that that has some more information. So either you guys can ask 
some questions for the last 10 minutes, or I could finish up the, the review for the last two things. Any, any questions about any things you don't understand so that we've gone over so far? Chapters 1 and 2. Or anything about clarifications on the exam? Chris? Yeah. So that, that was one of the review topics uh, that it, we didn't quite get to. So let me just jump over to that and say a few things. What did I do with my pen? So, new page here. And I'll post these. I'll get all the notes posted today. I'm lagging on a, on a few, so I'll get them all up, up there. But let's start with configuration constraints. Holonomic constraints. Right, F of X1, Y1, Z1, where X, Y, and Z are various um, configuration variables, like our Qs, all the way up to uh, So if we have some constraint that only has configuration variables in it, that is, has to do with constraining position. Okay, like I want a point that always has to be here, or um, a, a given vector, the tip of that vector always has to slide along a line, things like that. You can write these in, in some general a form. And then motion constraints or non holonomic constraints, they're similar. I call it G. <clears throat> and they have um, X1, Y1, Z1 potentially. But they also may have your x dots, right? That's supposed to be 1, 1, 1, x n dot, y n dot. Right? These are constraints that have speeds in them with one caveat. What's that caveat? Mixed partials have to commute. Right? And that means uh, it's integrable. If you can integrate it, then um, we, we shouldn't say mixed if If the mix, mixed partials commute, um, if mixed partials commute, then it's integrable. Right? And G is not a motion constraint. It is a configuration constraint. Right? So if the mixed partials of this with respect to all the um, all the coordinates commute, then that is a proof that that function is integrable and it will take us back to a function that has no speeds in it. Right? 
And we saw those things, especially in these um, no-slip rolling constraints, right? There, we're specifically talking about a velocity, right? We're not talking about a, uh, a position of a point. We're saying that, well, this, this point can have velocities that only move in a certain way, that only change in a certain way, right? So that's talking about uh, the motion of the point instead of the position of the point, right? It's true that if I say that a point can only slide along a rail, that it has a configuration constraint that makes that point stay on the rail. <clears throat> I can differentiate that configuration constraint, and I get, then I'll get x, y, z dots in that, in that term, in, in that equation. And it'll also say, well, the velocity can only be along the line, right? But <clears throat> I can integrate that equation and get back to the fundamental configuration constraint. And so, you know, we saw things like, you know, the velocity of P in N must equal zero or something like that. Whereas the top one would be something more like, you know, Q1 must equal L plus Q2, right? It says that Q1 is dependent on Q2. And this um, would say that the different speeds have some dependency. So N is the number of minimal, minimal number of speeds of uh, coordinates. M is the number of motion constraints. And then uh, in this case, capital M is the, um, if, I, if I say N equals, uh, I don't, I'm going to mess something up there, but let, let's just go with that. And then number of degrees of freedom is P, which equals N minus M. Is that worthwhile, or you want something more specific, or? Yeah. All right, we're basically out of time here. Should wrap it up. Any last question? Yes. If this partial commutes, then it's integrable, and G is not a motion constraint. And, and then if G is not integrable, right, mixed partials don't commute, then uh, it is a um, essential non-holonomic motion constraint. It is a central non-holonomic motion constraint if it's not integrable, which is what you, you just said, Thomas. All right, I've got to wrap it up here. Um, good luck on the exam.